All right, guys, how's it going? This is part two of my Skylake X review roundup. Part one had discussed the changes in the Skylake X architecture. That was mostly about the new mesh topology and also some pretty big changes to the cache. We saw over at Anantech that this had led to some pretty inconsistent performance. And then later on at PC Perspective, we saw gaming results where the 7900X lost every single benchmark to the previous generation 6950X, which I think came as a very big surprise to most people. The video was getting long, so I did decide to split it into two. I think a few people maybe didn't quite understand what I meant by that though. I didn't do that deliberately, as in I had the video and then just decided to split it. What I meant by that was I finished that video yesterday because I cut it short. So I uploaded it yesterday and now today I've been working on the second part. So the last video ended with me about to take a look at the Skylake X review over at Tom's Hardware. So let's continue with that. Now the author Paul Alcorn, who appears to be doing a lot of Tom's Hardware CPU stuff right now, came in for a bit of stick recently after his best CPUs article contained only Intel CPUs. Now obviously I did a video or two on that and there was some accusation of bias and in this review Paul for sure has shown that he is certainly not biased as this is probably the harshest review on Skylake X you will find. This is also a very good review, there's some great testing and I consider Paul to be one of the better reviewers out there today and from page one he made it clear that the Skylake X launch feels rushed. There's been a lot of motherboard firmware updates, a lot of bias updates which did address some of the oddities, however others persist. And he also believes that Skylake X models will require a period of optimization, much like AMD's Ryzen processors. On page two, he talked about some strange performance trends, which was very similar to what we saw on Anantech. Given Skylake X's frequency advantage, reworked cache and 2D mesh topology, we didn't expect Broadwell E to stand a chance. I think it's safe to say that nobody expected Broadwell E to beat Skylake X in anything, but that's clearly not what we're seeing. After contacting Intel, Intel responded that the losses are a result of the mesh architecture on Skylake X versus the ring architecture of Broadwell E. That doesn't really seem to make a lot of sense to me. The differences in the cache, for sure, are making a difference, but the mesh topology should just have been an advantage over the ring. There is some nice latency and bandwidth testing on page to as well and it's definitely showing higher core to core average latencies. Again this is not something we should see due to the mesh and is much more likely to be a result of the smaller victim cache L3. Now moving on to the game benchmarks and something to note is that Paul has retested Ryzen 7 and he noted that the Ryzen 7 1800X offers much better performance now than it did at launch, not just in Ashes but also in other benchmarks. Ashes of the Singularity was of course one of the games where Ryzen performed extremely poorly at launch but these issues have now been mostly fixed. As we can see the 1800X isn't that far behind the 6900K now but something to note is that the i7-6950X at 4.2 GHz does beat the 7900X at 4.5 GHz. So again, very much an IPC deficit when it comes to Ashes of the Singularity. Moving on to Tom's Civilization 6 graphics test, and the i9 is dead last, coming in well behind the Broadwell CPUs and a little behind the Ryzen CPUs. But then we see the flip side for the i9, Grand Theft Auto 5, and it is well ahead of any other CPU, including the 7700K and the 6950X. So it's faster than the fastest single core CPU, and it's also faster than the multi-core CPU, which has been beating it everywhere else, the 6950X. A bit of an oddity there, but it's worth pointing out that the stock i9 experiences some frame time variability in the early stages of the benchmark, as does the 7700K towards the end. And this is something we can see here. So the FPS numbers don't always tell the whole story. Tom's Hardware's workstation and HPC benchmarks once again throw up some pretty curious results where we see stuff like the i9 coming in well behind the 7700K but also a bunch of Ryzen CPUs and again in Photoshop where in some cases again it is dead last. So it doesn't appear to be a great one for Photoshop which to me is another optimization issue here. Whenever the workload can make use of those cores and frequency though, we see some crushing wins for the i9 over the rest of the competition. There was more power consumption and overclocking tests as well, where Paul was using an Alpha Cool Chiller 2000, and his conclusion was that air cooling is out of the question for the i9 7900X, and even a decent all-in-one liquid cooling solution won't get far. Running Prime 95, we saw some astronomical power consumption, almost twice the power consumption compared to the Ryzen 7 1800X, and over 50% higher than the 6950X. 
Paul's power numbers are very in-depth and very interesting. Take a look at those. And in page 11, he goes even further into the temperature and thermal problems. And his conclusion was very interesting as well, where he states that forward progress is what we want to see and at no point is a step backward all right in our books. And we saw a handful of those in today's tests. He then talked about Ryzen's puzzling performance issues at launch and that now revisiting Ryzen 7 1800X, remember he re-benchmarked all the numbers unlike PC perspective and that now left him with a very positive impression particularly compared to Intel's $1000 plus alternatives. Ryzen isn't as fast obviously but at the price point the value proposition is very hard to ignore. Overall Paul's article is very well worth reading and one you should certainly check out if you're interested in Skylake X. And regardless of the review, the story remains the same. Total War Warhammer, the 7900X performs worse than an i3. Hexus is most notable for their bang for buck and bang for watt charts. As you might expect, a CPU like the i9 performs pretty woefully regardless of the chart. It's extremely power hungry and it's extremely expensive. Intel CPUs like the i3 of course perform better in the single threaded benchmarks, whereas Cinebench bang for buck and bang for watt is completely dominated by Ryzen CPUs. Also notable at Texas was that they once again got higher than 100 degrees Celsius temperatures. That was with a notch or NHD 15, but it didn't matter even when switching to water cooling, it simply could not contend with the increase in voltages. And finally for Skylake X, over at TechSpot, where Steve was one of the few to get hold of all three CPUs, a little bit later than the rest, Interesting to see that he did do 7-zip properly, having both decompression and compression, and here indeed we can see that the 7900X does hold quite a commanding lead. The Ryzen 7 1800X does suffer quite a lot in compression. That's a good result for the 7820X here, which is of course now the 1800X's main competition. You don't need to look far for reversals though. 1800X and the 7820X, it's kind of win some, lose some. There's no doubt that the 7820X is faster overall. And we once again saw one of Skylake's major issues. The 7820X is about 10% faster overall, but it needs 40 watts of extra power to do that. And this is system power, so you are effectively talking another 40 watts on top, which is around about 33% or more extra power for that 10% extra performance. Overclocking was the exact same as anywhere else. You simply couldn't get higher than 4.6 GHz regardless of voltages, but it's all pretty moot anyway, as once again with an overclock, we started to see huge wattages and once again 100 degrees with water cooling. But the real story is told in Steve's analysis at the end, the price versus performance. He's now added quite a few price performance charts, whereas you might expect the 1800X does pretty well. The thing to note here though is, as Steve points out, the 1800X itself isn't particularly good value when compared against the Ryzen 7 1700. And this is indeed the biggest problem for new i7 Skylake Xs, the 7820 and the 7800 Xs. They don't look like particularly great value against the 1800X, but the 1800X didn't look like particularly great value anyway. It's when you compare it to the 1700 or even the 1700X now which can be picked up for $350. This CPU is perhaps between 10 and 15% slower than the 7820X, but when you take the price and the price of the platform into consideration, you're looking at something that is effectively half the price. Another great review over at TechSpot, be sure to check that one out. All that's left now is a quick look at Kaby Lake X before I get to my conclusion. Finally, over at Hardware Canucks, they had a Kaby Lake X i7-7740X. Their conclusion was quite something. What could have been a compelling product ended up being a complete relaunch of the 7700K at the exact same price. But in this case, it comes with lower performance and not one additional feature. The author also says that with the i7-7740X, Intel is forcing you to make a decision. Either buy a Kaby Lake X and lose all of the features which make X299 an enthusiast level platform, or buy a processor that costs a thousand bucks. There is no middle ground anymore since every one of the i7-7800 processors is seriously nerfed in some way. And this conclusion is basically seen everywhere on the web. Skylake X has many, many problems. Way more cons than pros. And all the reviewers are saying the same thing. Over at TechSpot, it's extremely power hungry and considerably more expensive than the Ryzen equivalents. Gaming sees a performance regression. Price is still too high. And again, poor thermal performance. What Intel has done here with Skylake X is created a server processor. Now Broadwell E is also a server processor, but this time Intel has now pushed it further, increasing the L2 
decreasing the L3, making the L3 a victim cache, people expected to see the 7900X topping the chart in every benchmark, but in some cases it's even losing to the 1700X and far too often loses to the previous generation Broadwell E. And on PC Perspective, we saw that the gaming performance simply isn't on par, in many cases much like Ryzen. So if it's not a gaming CPU, then what's it for? Well, we've already seen its massive performance when it actually works, sometimes over 30% faster than Broadwell E. The issue here, of course, is not Broadwell E. The issue here is that when AMD launches Threadripper, 16 cores and 32 threads, all of these crushing multi-threaded victories will be turned into crushing multi-threaded defeats. We don't know if AMD will sell Threadripper at $1,000, but there's every reason to believe that at least one version will come in at below $1,000. So it leaves the Skylake X in a very difficult position, stuck between a rock and a hard place. The rock is the previous Intel CPUs, and in terms of value proposition, Ryzen just looks way, way better value. And the hard place is coming soon with Threadripper, which will, in multi-threaded terms, be far and away the fastest CPU on the desktop. This Cinebench score of 2169, Threadripper could easily be 50% higher than that. And in most cases, we should expect between 20 and 30, 20 to 40% faster in multi-threading. And the news just continued to get worse because recently we learned that Skylake and KB Lake processors have got broken hyper-threading. A critical flaw has been discovered. Luckily, this will be fixable in the BIOS. What we don't know yet is if this will hurt performance. We'll need to wait for more information on that. The final summary here is Skylake X. It is fast when it works. Blazing fast, nothing can touch it in certain loads. Nothing yet can touch it in certain loads. It is far, far too inconsistent though. And there appears to be no reason to buy this CPU for gaming purposes. And with the entire platform costing that bit more, it's really difficult to justify it for much. In terms of gaming, will we see optimizations? It doesn't really seem likely. You think about it, you're a game developer. Are you going to target optimizations for Skylake X? All the different core sizes, all the different cache sizes, and what is effectively very small sales. It seems pretty unlikely that developers will even bother optimizing for it, and what we could see is gaming performance gets worse over the coming years, which is not what you would expect to see with multi-core processors. Now you might think that's complete opposite from what I said about AMD and Ryzen, which is true. But AMD said that Ryzen would be optimised for gaming, and this is what we're seeing. We saw it in Rise of the Tomb Raider, we saw it in Ashes, we saw it in Total War Warhammer. This is something I'm following very closely. Just a couple of days ago, a tweet showing that AMD is hiring CPU optimization specialists for Ryzen, Threadripper and their future stuff. And again over at Tom's conclusion, where Paul said that enthusiasts might hope for similar improvements from Intel. Because after all, AMD is overcoming its roadblocks with a fraction of the R&D budget. And when they asked Intel if they expect software-based optimization to fix what disappointed us, Intel company rep said it could improve performance. No mention of them forcing the issue. AMD has already sent out 300 Ryzen developer systems and are aiming for 1000. They're putting Ryzen in the hands of game developers. What's Intel doing with their massive budget, hoping that things get better? This is not what we want to see. Intel can easily afford to send Skylake X to every developer on the planet. So why are they not saying that that's what they're doing? I know what the answer is to that. With the previous architecture, before the change to the cache system, Intel's high-end desktop CPUs simply benefited from the natural optimizations for their desktop CPUs like their i5, their i7, 7700Ks. It's basically the same architecture with more cores and more cache. So as games naturally became more multi-threaded, we started to see some wins for Broadwell E. But in this case, they would need to specifically optimise for Skylake X, and that would mean more multi-threaded games. The fact is, Intel makes a lot more money from low core count desktop CPUs. There is really nothing for them to gain from multi-core optimizations. If games today were optimised for 8 threads, your i5s would be absolutely useless, and even the 7700K would be starting to look weak, even against CPUs like the Ryzen 5. The last thing they want is a core war with AMD on the desktop. In the end, it's a backward step in many, many ways. It's inconsistent, it's power hungry, and the temperatures are just insane. And it's almost impossible to recommend any of these CPUs. No matter what your workload is, there's either something better out there now, or something much faster will be coming pretty soon. I'll catch you later guys.